Thanks for joining me again for our study through the book of Luke as we walk through the life of Christ. You know, as an undergrad history major, uh, I had a professor tell me that history is one thing after another. But the study of history is understanding why one thing happens after another thing happens. You know, on an individual basis, understanding why things happen in our life, really a lot of those things are, are built on our choices, the choice we make. On a thing about today, uh, the choices that you made today got you, got you to where you are right now. The choices you made today uh, helped uh, dictate what you got accomplished today. They helped dictate how your day went. On a larger scale in our individual lives, the choice we make related to how we respond to Jesus really affects not just our day to day, but much more in our life and really into our eternity. In today's lesson, we're going to learn that Jesus's offer of salvation will be rejected by some leading to judgment. In one of our previous lessons, we learned about John the Baptist, and about John the Baptist's ministry. And Luke tells us much about what he preached about and what he taught about. But after that, Luke tells us that John baptized Jesus. Now we might wonder, why did John need to baptize Jesus? Well, we learn in one of the other gospels that Jesus says he needs to be baptized so he can be revealed to Israel. Let's take a moment, let's look at that baptism of Jesus. 3, 21 and 22 says, When all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. As he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, I take delight in you. This is one of the most informative pieces of Scripture related to the nature of God. You see, here we have Jesus, who's just been baptized, standing in the Jordan River. As he comes up out of the river, uh, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who has no bodily form, takes on the form of a dove and comes down and lands on Jesus. After that, the, the heavens open, and the God the Father speaks uh, to the crowd and announces who Jesus is. You see, here we have a picture of God the Trinity. We have a picture of Jesus the Son in human form. We have a picture of the Holy Spirit, we have a picture of the Father. God is triune. Now, I don't understand all that. It's hard to understand. It's hard to explain, but it is the truth. After this uh, encounter uh, at the Jordan River with John and his followers and being baptized, Jesus then goes out into the wilderness where he fasts for a while and he prays for a while. And at the end of that, he's being he, he gets tempted. And Jesus counteracts all the temptations that come at him in the wilderness with Scripture. And after that, Jesus then returns to his hometown. And that's really where our story picks up today, with Jesus returning to Nazareth, where he grew up, uh, where he was a baby, where he was a young man, and, uh, and where, he, uh, where everyone knew him. Everyone knew that he was, in their minds, Joseph's son. So let's pick up and let's look at Jesus returning to Nazareth. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophets Isaiah was given to him. And unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. Now, upon returning to his hometown, Jesus goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as, as would be expected of him, as would be normal for him. And, and he goes in and he, he, uh, he's chosen that day to read from and comment on the scripture. Now, this might be a common thing to do when you have a visiting person in the town, or maybe Jesus had come back and they said, hey, you haven't been here in a while, I want you to do it. Or maybe they, uh, they chose him because, like they would, maybe a visiting rabbi or somebody like that. We don't really know why exactly Jesus was chosen, but he was. And so he was given the scroll to read. And the scroll comes from Isaiah chapter 61. Now, we don't know if Jesus chose to read this or if it was given to him to read. We don't really know what, what circumstances led to this being read, but we know Jesus was reading it. And now, Isaiah chapter 61 is interesting because it concerns information about the Messiah. Now, with hindsight, we see it's pretty fitting that Jesus was reading from Isaiah chapter 61. 
And we're going to discuss it in a minute. Before we do, I want you, though, to, to read over part of Isaiah chapter 61, or, uh, over this part of this passage that Jesus reads. And I want you to pick out some verbs or some action words that, that point to phrases uh, that outline what the Messiah will be doing. Teachers, if you do this in your class, I encourage you to maybe break your class up into groups of two or three and have them do this and then have them report back afterwards. Take a moment and do this activity for me. First, we see here that the Messiah is going to preach good news. Now, the good news won't be culminated, won't come to fruition exactly until Jesus' life, death, uh, burial, and resurrection is complete. But Jesus is beginning the process of preaching toward that good news. We see next that the Messiah is going to proclaim the release of captives. Jesus is like a herald proclaiming the release of the captives to the people. Uh, that captive is held captive by sin. So Jesus is saying the captives will be freed. Last, next it says that he will recover the sight of the blind. Jesus literally does that. He actually helps people who are blind recover their sight through, uh, through his miraculous means. And lastly, it says that he will uh, set the oppressed free. Uh, Jesus doesn't just herald the coming of uh, freedom of the captives. He will set the captives free. Jesus isn't just the herald. He is the means by which one is freed from sin. Jesus says all this is fulfilled in your sight. And as we move into the next passage of Scripture, before we do that, I want you to consider how would you respond to Jesus when he said all this is fulfilled in your sight? Now, you may know this story. You may know what's coming. But, but think about that. How would one respond to Jesus saying that. I want you to think about that for a second, hang on to that, and then we're going to read the next section of Scripture. Luke chapter 4, verses 23 to 27. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said to them, No doubt you will quote the proverb to me, Doctor, kill yourself what we've heard that took place in Capernaum do here in your hometown also. He also said, I, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's day when the sky was shut up for three years and six months while a great famine came over the land. But Elijah was not sent to any of them except for the widow of Zarephath and Sidon. And in the, and in the prophet Elisha's time, there were many in Israel who had leprosy, and yet not one of them was clean except Naaman the Syrian. Now, initially, they responded pretty positively to Jesus' comments on Scripture. Uh, I mean, he's a hometown boy. He's come back. It's, he's, a, he's got a kind of a, a right thought on Scripture, it seems, and this is pretty impressive. And, and no doubt they had heard about Jesus' miracles in Capernaum, and, and Jesus knew what they were thinking. Jesus knew what was going on in their head, and that's why Jesus throws out this proverb. And it's in a proverb from the Old Testament. It's not a proverb from the book of Proverbs. And it's just a common saying of the day. And generally, it means that a practitioner should practice his, his skill, his trade on himself first. Or in this case, in his hometown first. You see, they wanted Jesus to perform some miracles in Nazareth like he had in Capernaum. They wanted Jesus to show them what he could do. And, uh, and Jesus, he didn't really have any of that. Um, they had preconceived notions of what Jesus would do. They have preconceived notions of what the Lord would do. Consider this for a moment. What preconceived ideas about Jesus might a person hold today? How do those ideas get in the way of accepting him as Savior? Now, many times people can have preconceived notions about God or about Jesus that are a turnoff for them. They, they, uh, they, they're they turned off before they even really hear the gospel message. Maybe they think God is going to be super judgmental and they just don't even want to talk about it. They don't even want to hear about what we have to say about the gospel. Sometimes people might have a, a, a differently unbalanced view of God and think Jesus is all loving and all accepting and, and the gospel message that includes a talk of sin, it's a turnoff. You see, they won't even hear the truth because we're, because sometimes we're turned off by our preconceived notions of who God is and how God is supposed to act in, in our mind. And so Jesus gives two examples from the Old Testament how sometimes God does things a little bit differently. He talks about Elijah. 
Now, Elijah was a prophet in the 9th century BC, and he was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel, and, and, uh, and he was prophesying against the king. And he, he had some rough stuff to say. And uh, the people and the king, they, they turned on him. They didn't want to hear it. So God sent a famine. And God sent uh, Elijah to a brook where he drank from the brook for a while, and he was fed, fed by ravens. Uh, and uh, in the process, he, he, was, uh, he was hiding out from the king and whatnot, but God was caring for him. Well, after a while, there was a famine. The brook uh, 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 got real dry. No water in the, in, in the, in the canal. So, uh, so God said, Elijah, I want you to go to see a lady. Go see the widow Zarephath in the, in the area of Sidon. Go up there, and, and he did. And while he was there, God took care of him, and God took care of the widow. And, uh, and back in Israel, things just kept getting worse. There was a famine, and, uh, and Elijah was there, and God was taking care of it. Now, a little while later, after Elijah dies, uh, his, uh, his uh, student, Elisha, uh, had a similar uh, uh, time where God did something that maybe people wouldn't understand, wouldn't, wouldn't really get. You see, Elisha was approached uh, by a military leader from the Syrian army, uh, Israel's enemy, and, uh, and he had a problem with leprosy. And so uh, Elisha, through, uh, through God, through Elisha, uh, told this man how to be healed. You see, two times God acts in ways that the Jews of Jesus' day really would not understand. You see, and actually, by bringing these two examples up, these two examples that are contrary to the people of Nazareth's view of who God is, that really might anger them. You see, in Jesus' day, the, the Jews were really nationalistic. They, they, were, uh, they, they come out of, out of exile many, many years before, and they, they kind of coalesced as a people. And now they're having to deal with the, 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 the Romans who have come in and are ruling over them. And, and the fact that God would care for the widow at Sidon and that God would care for the, uh, the leader of a foreign army over the people of Israel, because there were a lot of widows in Israel who could use some help. There were a lot of people in Israel who could, uh, who could be, be killed from leprosy. But, uh, but God chose to choose these two people to heal and take care of. And that really offended the sensibilities of the people at Nazareth. That really stood counter-opposed to their preconceived notions of God. Through these real-life illustrations, God demonstrated familiarity does not guarantee God's work. Now, Elisha and Elijah went outside of Israel to a people who were unfamiliar with God, and unfamiliar even with God's ways, and God cared for those people in the process. And the people, the people of Nazareth who were familiar with Jesus were expecting a miracle. The people of Nazareth with whom Jesus was familiar were expecting him to show them what he's got. Jesus said, no, we don't, we don't, we don't do things that way. We don't occupy inside your pre preconceived notions. Now, we cannot uh, construe this account to, uh, to help us understand modern-day prayer for healing. That's not what we're talking about here. What we are talking about is how these people's preconceived notions stood in the way of them understanding who Jesus was and what Jesus was going to do. Let's keep moving forward and let's look at the next set of verses and see how they respond when Jesus doesn't act the way they want him to. Look at chapter 4, verses 28 through 30. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed through the crowd and went on his way. Now, there's something interesting here that happens. Um, the people, they don't just get mad at Jesus. No, they get mad at Jesus, and they try and kill Jesus. Now, I want you to think ahead, if you know the story about Jesus' life, think ahead to later in his life when the religious leaders decided it was time to kill him. How did they justify killing him? Now, in their minds, they had their reasons. But they justified it by saying that he claimed to be the Messiah and therefore claimed to be God, and that was blasphemy, so therefore he deserved death. Now, the people of Nazareth, Jesus had just claimed to be this, the Messiah, and they didn't kill him. They didn't decide to kill him until he, decided, until he told them that God acts in a way that is different from their preconceived Jewish-centric ideas of who God should care for. They got mad at Jesus when Jesus didn't act the way they expected Jesus to act. 
You know, many times when we present the gospel to people uh, or we try and share the gospel with folks, they, their preconceived notions are going to get in the way. When God doesn't act the way they expect God to act, or when God doesn't talk the way they expect God to talk or, or whatever it is, they, they tend to reject it. Now, as believers, you know, we can kind of do the same thing. When we read, when we read through Scripture or we hear someone teaching or preaching uh, through Scripture and it doesn't fit our preconceived understandings of who Christ is, instead of uh, asking the Spirit, is that true, or looking at the Bible to see if it's true, we, we reject it outright. When God tells us we should love someone who, in our mind, we don't need to love, or, or when the Scripture tells us we should care for some people and our preconceived understanding says that we don't need to care for those, we ignore it. We turn our back on it. When God asks us to act in a way that does not fit our preconceived understandings, we turn our backs on that. We reject Jesus in that sense. We might follow him with our heart. We might love Jesus. We might be believers. But sometimes we reject the teachings of Jesus because it doesn't fit in with what we think Jesus would want us to do. It doesn't fit in with what we feel like doing. So Jesus goes on, and after the people take him up to the hill, Jesus, uh, he, he walks away. He just walks through the crowd. I'm not sure all that went down, but he just walks away. And you know what he does? He goes back to Capernaum, and he continues teaching there. He continues healing there. The fact that the people in Nazareth rejected Jesus doesn't change who Jesus is. It doesn't change what Jesus was all about. The same applies to us today. Jesus told his followers, people are going to reject you. They're going to reject you for my sake. Well, the word for us today is when people reject us for Jesus' sake, we don't just stop what we're doing. We don't, we, we don't stop acting the way Jesus asks us to act. When people reject us for Jesus' sake, we don't stop doing the ministry God called us to do. We just keep right on doing it. Because when people reject us for Jesus' sake, Jesus says they're rejecting him, they're rejecting me, he says. So today we saw that Jesus' offer of salvation will be rejected by some, leading to judgment. Jesus came to offer salvation. He pointed to it in Isaiah. And all people who hear Jesus' message, no matter where we're, whether it's the gospel message for the first time or whether it's a message to how we should act in the future, we need, to, we need to consider our preconceived notions. The people in Nazareth couldn't get past what they thought God would do. And lastly, Jesus' rejection does not change who Jesus is and what Jesus does. This week I want to challenge you. If a friend asks you what you believe about Jesus, how would you respond? What could you share from this passage that might help you give an answer? And then the second question for you to consider is, when have you reacted poorly to something Jesus was doing in your life, and what did you learn from that experience? Well, thanks for joining me again for our study in the book of Luke. It's a quick look at, the, at Jesus returning to his hometown. Remember, this week God's going to ask you to do something. It may not fit into what you think God might ask you to do. It may not fit into what you think God uh, has called you to. But if he calls you to it, I challenge you, respond to what he's calling you to do and respond well.